So welcome back to our financial instrument section. So we're going to look at the specific area in your syllabus. It's a conscious ice 32 for the treatment for the compound financial instrument. Um, as you can see the financial instrument, as you can say, that, being, that means, let me just draw you a graph here. So that means if a company issues the compound instrument or compound financial instrument and the holder who bought this and that means from a holder's point of view we could get the cash back from the uh, instrument at the end let's say for the three years at the same time I've got the option to become the shareholder so that's what I mean by compound financial instruments. So uh, it's quite different from the traditional uh, debt instruments that we've seen, where we can only get the interest payments uh, as well as the uh, redemption value back. But for the compound instruments, we can also become the shareholder. And if that's the case, then okay, for the holder's point of view, and that would be a financial asset because that would be an example of the investments in debt instruments. But it does not pass the contractual cash flow characteristics tests because it not only contains the interest as well as the redemption element, but also it, it also contains the equity element. And as a result of it, and that would be the fair value through PO okay, measurement. And for the company who issues the uh, compound financial instrument, so we need to do that from the IS32's point of view. We're going to split into the debt or liability element as well as the equity element. So a simple idea being, for example, if we issue one convertible bond or convertible financial instrument or compound financial instrument, you can use different words for that. So with the nominal value being $100, which means the company would debit cash worth $100 uh, at the start that we issue that. But we need to split that 100 into debt as well as the equity element. So for example, after we calculate the debt element by discounting all those future interest payments as well as the redemption value, let's say $98. We're going to put the balancing figure to equity worth of two. So that's how we account for it. Not too difficult. And of course, we're going to look at these scenarios for this. The question is called Tom. I'm going to bring all these bits and pieces before we look at the narrative parts later on. Okay, so required it is, it is to show the initial measurement and subsequent measurement for the convertible bond. So that convertible bond is the compound financial instruments. So let's see then, we're told that Tom issued 1 million convertible bond on 1st June 2011 and the bond has the term of 3 years, it was issued at a total fair value of $100 million which also the power value. So that means okay, we received $100 million as the cash that we issued before. So that question is called Tom. So the first thing that we're going to do for initial measurements because we sold it, which means we issue it and we get cash worth 100 million. So we debit cash worth 100 million dollars. And what we need to do, as I told you, and that will be a financial liability, yeah, from a company's point of view. So the financial liability, uh, where not is a derivative, of course, is no, it's not a derivative. So, uh, also we haven't adopted the fair value option for that, so we're going to use the amortised cost table for this. So we're going to credit to so split into liability or debt, if you like. The balancing figure will put that into equity. So always do it like this from the uh, holder's point of view. The question is how we're going to calculate that liability. Was the ways that we're going to calculate that liability would be to calculate the present value 
of the future cash flows. Uh, those cash flows will include two things. First of all, for interest payments, and secondly, for the redemption value that we need to settle at the end of the term of the bond. So we're told it's three years, that's fine. Interest is paid annually at a coupon rate of 6%. So on 6%, on that, $100 million as the par value, and hence, okay. First of all, for interest elements, we've got the year one, and year two, and year three. We simply plot them together. So, for example, the interest per annum or per year is to be 6% or 100, so which means 6% times 100 million, and that would be 6 million per year. And hence we take 6, 6, and 6 in each and every year. But at the end of the third year, um, we're not told in the question that, uh, oh, okay, if the investor does not convert those into shares, they would have been redeemed at par there will be no premium for that, which means the investors, if they want to get cash at the end of the third year, they can get $100 million back. So this means that for the third year, we're going to plot the redemption value for this for 100 So we're going to discount all those cash flows at the proper discount rate. But the question is, which rate we are going to use? Well, always in the question it says, without a conversion option, a chance in an interest rate of 9% per annum. So we're going to discount it at 9%. So year one will be a power of one, year two will be a power of two, and year three will be the power of three. That's how we do the discounting for that. So the total will be 92.4 million, and we simply take that 92.4 million as the liability there. Okay, but here's the funny part. You may have a question, well Steve, why should we use 9% as the discount rate, not 6% as we've seen as the coupon rate? Well the answer is this. So for example, in the marketplace, you've got two options. The first option would be to buy a bond with the interest rates that you're going to, interest incomes that you're going to receive of 9% in each and every year. Compared to the second one, you only receive 6% of the coupon. Which one are you going to use? Or which one are you going to choose? One or two? If I were you, I would certainly choose number one because two bonds are the same. One is higher interest rate, one is lower. I'm going to choose the higher one. So that's the reason why if, with, with, uh, if there's without any options to convert the bond into shareholder, of course the bonds number two will never be bought by others. And that's the reason why if that, um, the bonds number two contains the options to become the shareholder, and that means I don't have to offer 9% of interest rate anymore, because as you can see, that would be a benefit to those holders to become the shareholder and that would be a cost for that already and that's the reason why we're going to lower down the uh, interest cost from 9% to 6% because we have already reflected uh, the cost to become the shareholder in three years times for example and that's the reason why we're going to discount all those cash flows at the uh, interest rate without the conversion option which is the first one which will be 9% so that's the reason why we're going to use 9% there so what about for equity? A home's minus 92.4 and that would be 7.6 million as the balancing figure for the equity. And that's how we do the initial measurements. But we are told also in the question that um, the company incurred the issue costs of 1 million. So from that perspective then, I'm 
um, doing the accounting from uh, our, I mean, our company. So we issued, we, we incurred the issue cost, which means uh, we issued the convertible bond, allowing the holder to become the shareholder, perhaps. And hence, I need to pay for that $1 million as the issue cost. If I pay for that $1 million as the issue cost, so from a company's point of view, uh, as I told you before, from the financial liability, we create cash and debit the financial liability, which means we're going to reduce that liability. Yeah. So for that issue cost, from an early study, we know that we need to credit cash of one million, and we're going to debit the liability, yeah. or the financial liability, if you like. But we cannot simply charge $1 million into liability only. It's simply because, as you can see, we recognize the equity uh, option there to reflect the fact that the, share, that the debt holder may become the shareholder eventually. And that's the reason why what we're going to do then, according to IS number 32, is going to allocate that $1 million of the issue costs that we spend on a pro rata basis. And that means in this case, the liability accounts for 92.4 over 100 in total. And the equity will be 7.6 over 100 in total. So we're going to allocate that $1 million on a pro rata basis to liability first of all. So 1 million times 92.4 divided by 100 and that would be not points nine to four million dollars and for the equity we're going to remove that or reduce it by debiting it one million times seven point six over hundred and that would be not point oh seventy six million okay that will be issue cost how we're going to uh, remove it or, or reduce it in other words and that means all we need to do then, uh, as you can see, because for the financial liability, uh, it's not for trading purpose because this is not a derivative, this is not an interest rate swap, this is not a forward contract, that kind of stuff. And all we need to do is going to use the amortised uh, cost method to create the amortisation table uh, to account for a liability. Okay. So for a subsequent measurement, let's see. So for subsequent measurements, uh, we're going to create years, and then opening balance, interests, outstanding, OIOIC if you can remember that, installments that we pay for the interests, and closing balance. Okay, for the first year of end, what will be the opening balance for liability? Well, so you can see, the liability will be uh, 92.4 at the start. Uh, we need to subtract the issue costs worth of 0.924. Okay. So that will become 91.476. So what we need to do then is we're going to unwind to, or increase the liability up by the interest rate, but which rate we are going to use. So, if you look at the third paragraph, the final sentence for that is, we're told the impact of the issue costs of 1 million has increased the effective rate or effective interest rate to become 9.38%. So, as I said, we're going to unwind the um, liability at the effective interest rate of 9.38%. So 9.38% times 91.476, and that would be 8.58 million. So our standing liability would be 0.056 million. 
the installments is where we pays the interest uh, how much? 6% or 100 million? That would be 6 million per annum. That would be a closing balance of liability, 94.056. Second year, or a medium, for example, 94.056 times 9.38%, so plus um, 8.822. Outstanding, 102, 878 minus 6, and that would be 96, 978. Carry this forward, why not? And we settle, let me just round it up to 106, that would be better. And we settle 6 of the interests, a redemption value of 100, and that will be 0 at the end of the third year. Okay. So all we need to do then in each and every year, uh, we need to provide for the finance costs by debiting the finance costs were of 8.58822 uh, and 9.021 each and every year and credits the financial liability in each and every year. And of course for the instalment we simply debit the financial liability of 6, 6 and 100 in each and every year and we credit cash paid uh, worth of this amount in each and every year. So if for example Suppose that the investor or the uh, bondholder would convert, convert the convertible bond into shares on that particular date. So we are told that if at maturity all of the bonds were converted into 25 million shares uh, with one dollar each, and if that's the case, if we suppose that the uh, bondholder converts all those, uh, all those bond or liability into shares, how are we going to account for it? So the final bit, upon conversion. So the idea would be this. First of all, if you look at the amortized cost table, in this case, we are assuming that the investor will only convert the liability into shares and not receiving the $100 back or $100 million back. And that means the closing liability for this will still be $100 million, if that's the case. And that's all we can do. It's going to get rid of the financial liability by $100 million, or debt, if you like, first of all. But instead of paying for you, cash. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pay for you shares. So I'm going to credit the share capital or ordinary share capital if you like. Allowing you to convert into 25 million shares with one dollar each. So 25 million in total. But what about for the others? As you can see at the start that we recognize the equity component worth of 7.6 with the net issue cost pro rata to equity of 0.076. So we still got the balance of 7.524 million of the equity uh, components there. So we're going to remove that equity proportion by taking 7.6 million minus 0.076 million and that will become 7.5 to 4 million dollars. For a debit balance is much greater than the credit balance and hence we're going to put the balancing figure to share premium. Okay. So the balancing figure will be 82.5 to 4 million if uh, the bond is converted to shares for example. Okay. 
We're not going to put that into the accounting game, but rather we're going to put that into the premium, or share premium if you like. Because now we issue some shares, it's the equity instrument from our company's point of view. Okay. Now, if we go back to the narratives onto the first page for a convertible debt or compound financial instrument, that debt would include the debt element as well as the equity element, that would be balancing figure, and we need to exclude uh, any of these issue costs on a pro rata basis. For subsequent measurements, we are not going to remeasure the equity component because the basic idea behind it is we remeasure the asset, we remeasure the liability, but equity would just be the residual value or residual interests. We never revalue the equity. But equity instruments or investments in equity instruments, that would be an example of asset. We do revalue it, but for equity, we don't revalue this. The liability we use amortized costs, as we've seen before, net off against any of these issue costs on a pro rata basis. And when we finally convert that bond into, for example, shares, uh, that's the reason why we're going to do the double entry for the upon conversion, finally. If this is not the case, we convert that into cash, of course, for the uh, amortized cost table for the first circumstance, we're going to minus the redemption value at the end of the third year. Okay, so we simply debit the uh, liability and credit the cash paid if the uh, holder decides to choose the options to convert that into cash rather than uh, the shares. The next area that we're going to learn would be, according to IFRS number 7, about the disclosure part of the financial instruments. So all we need to do is going to show the, uh, for, from the uh, statement of financial positions point of view the significance of each financial instrument including different classes for that, for example P&L, OCR, that kind of stuff. Any of this derecognition, reclassification, we need to disclose that as well as we've seen before. For the P&O, we need to separately disclose each class of financial instrument, P&O, OCI, that kind of stuff. Finance costs, we need to separately disclose that, for example, uh, the investment in debt instruments, OCI, amortised costs, how we recognise them. Impairment losses, we also need to recognize, uh, disclose that separately. And also we need to disclose other information for that as well, for example the accounting policy fair value, how we determine that. And also we need to disclose the risks of the financial instruments. So for example, how to manage those risks, perhaps we're going to hedge against those, which means the qualitative parts of the risks and the strategies in place. The quantitative parts of the risks, for example, where not uh, the uh, financial assets been subject to impair, subject to impairment, any of its market risks or market prices changes, or interest rate changes, the exchange rate changes, what would be the impact onto our assets liability? We need to disclose them. So all we need to understand is we need to understand, we need to disclose the significance and the risks of the financial instruments. That'll be absolutely enough for this particular session. I hope you enjoy it. And I'm going to stop here and look forward to seeing you in the next of our session then. APC, accounting for your future.